Welcome and thank you for checking out our service. Make sure to visit our website, sardiniacc.com, or download our church app to stay up to date and connected with everything going on here at SCC. And no matter where you're tuning in from today, we hope that this message encourages you and challenges you to follow Jesus and make disciples. God bless, and we hope to see you soon at one of our live in-person worship gatherings on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Well, greetings and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our online service. If you have been joining us over the last several weeks or months, we want to thank you uh, for taking time out each week and joining us for our online service. We hope that you have been blessed. Uh, we are going to continue to put those out there for you uh, so that you can still uh, worship from home or, or wherever you are. Uh, we want to make sure that you stay connected this way. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, we are beginning a brand new series today called Identity Theft. And you know, identity theft, uh, it really does affect many, many people around the world today. In 2003, uh, after his elderly mother passed away, a man named Thomas Parkin assumed her identity by raiding her closet and dressing up in old lady clothes and wigs, which allowed him to c collect his mother's social security checks and even renew her driver's license over the course of the next six years until he was caught. Another Australian woman named Nicole McCabe was listening to the radio in her apartment when she heard her name listed uh, as one of three suspects that were wanted for the assassination of a political leader in the Middle East. She later discovered that the real suspects had obtained her personal information and created fake passports. And, you know, while millions of people suffer from cases of stolen identity like this, every single year around the world, the truth is that we've all been victims of identity theft. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about the way in the way of someone opening up a fraudulent account in your name or, or making a purchase using your credit, but what I am talking about is that we've all fallen victim to having the most fundamental thing about who we are being taken from us. One of the most basic questions any human being can ever ask is, who am I? It's a question we seek the answer to and we, we try to figure out from the moment we're born. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? And from that point on, we spend much of our life trying to answer those questions. We search and we search for our true identity. We want to know and understand who we are at the core. 
And, and so far in our world, we've come up with all sorts of answers to that. I mean, today you can identify as just about anything you want to. Uh, people can identify themselves by their, their gender and sexuality, their, their nationality, skills, strengths, weaknesses. Uh, you can be identified with your, your class, your race, uh, with an illness, with an addiction. Uh, you can identify with a certain people group or culture. You can be identified by your religion, your political persuasion, or your level of education. You can identify yourself as supernatural, two-spirited. Uh, you can identify yourself as an animal, an inanimate object, or even a Bengals fan. All right, I'm sorry, Bengals fans. I'm just, I'm just, I miss football. I'm ready for it. Uh, you know, the search for identity expands far and wide in our world and in our culture. People spend years, in some cases, their entire lifetime searching to find their identity. And maybe if we're honest, if you're honest, maybe that's where you are today. Uh, that's where you find yourself. You're, you're trying to find who you are. And, and you've tried to find it many ways. You've tried to find it uh, on the ball field or in the classroom, or in a romantic relationship, or in your career, or in being a good parent or child. And you've tried to, to define yourself by hard work and achievement. And you keep searching and searching, but, but who you are always seems to elude you. Like I said, today we're beginning a new series called Identity Theft. And, and what we're going to look, look at throughout this series is the truth that identities are not found, they are given. Identities are not found, they are given to us. You can spend your whole life searching for who you are, you can try to define yourself by a number of things, but the fact is you cannot find your identity. Your identity is given to you. We see this in the very beginning. We see this in the creation account of the world. And so if, if you have your Bibles, you can turn and follow along. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 1. In the very first book of the Bible, uh, the very first chapter of Scripture, we see God at work creating everything, creating the whole world. He creates light and sky and, and stars and plants and trees and birds and fish and all of the animals. And every time he creates something new, the author of Genesis uh, notes that God said, or God made, or God called. He called forth. He called out. God spoke. He said, let there be. Every time God spoke something into existence, he spoke it himself. But then we get to verse 26 of chapter 1, and it says this, and then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. You see, when we get to this verse of the creation account, God says something different. He says, let us make man in our image, our likeness. It's, it's plural, that word, our. God is implying relationship here. But the question is, relationship with who? Well, the author of Genesis, he, he clarifies this a little bit earlier. Uh, it says, the Spirit of God hovered above the waters. In the New Testament book of John, John the author declares that Jesus, the Word, the eternal Son of God, was with God in the beginning at creation. You see, all three persons of the Lord, all three persons of the Trinity were here and present in the beginning. And God says that, that He wants to make man in His image, in our image, the image of relationship, the image of love. God says, I want people to be more special than any other thing I've created. I want them to be made in my image. In the very beginning of time, God gave us our identity. He said that we are special creations made in His image. Embedded in our very existence is the image of God. The Lord exists 
eternally in relationship between the Father and Son and Spirit. And we were created to exist in relationship with Him as well. This is what it means to be made in the image of God. But you see, God doesn't stop there. He, he continues to expound and, and expand our, our identity. In verse uh, 26, it says, um, let us make man in, in our image and our likeness. And then he continues, he says, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God gives us purpose in our identity. He says, I want you to care for my creation. He gives us this purpose to be his partner in cultivating and managing and caring for all that he made. And notice, we don't do it alone. You see, he created other people, male and female. In chapter 2 of Genesis, God says that it's not good for man to be alone, and so he creates another person. We were created by God in the image of God to be in relationship with him, but also with one another. We were created by God in the image of God uh, to care for his creation. That is our identity. The image of God is who we are. And God gave us that identity. That's the identity that was given to us by God to all people, every person ever created for all time. And then we see in Genesis chapter 2, God gives a few more things to help man understand and live out this identity. In, in chapter 2, verse 15, <clears throat> it says, The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it, and take care of it. So he gives them a place and a space to live, this, this garden. He gives them the freedom to live out their identity. He gives them provision, everything they need to live, uh, you know, food, shelter, relationship. He gives it all to them. He also gives them responsibility. He gives them everything they need to carry out this purpose and, and their identity. He even gave them some parameters that were designed to, to keep them in this image of perfect relationship. In verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat uh, from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So he cared enough to give them some boundaries and so we see that our identity from the very beginning has always been something that was given to us. It wasn't found. It was given. Man was given identity by his creator. He spoke our identity into us just as, as he had breathed the breath of life into Adam. He also spoke that identity into us. But if identities are given and not found, and if, if the identity that is given to us is given to us by our creator, by our identity giver, then by nature, we discover that identities can also be taken away. They can be stolen. You see, God gives us our identity. He wants nothing more than for us to receive it and to live out that identity. But there is another whose mission is to steal that identity from us. You see, we first see that thief sneak onto the scene in Genesis chapter 3. And starting in verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
You see, just when everything was was as it should be, when people walked in perfect relationship with God and one another, when man understood who he was, his identity, and he'd lived it out perfectly, that's when the serpent comes on the scene. You see, Satan, whom Scripture describes as a liar and a thief, he appears and he attempts one of the greatest, the greatest heist in human history. And how does he pull it off? Well, let's take a little bit of a closer look here. What's the first thing he says when we see him? He says, did God really say? You see, he questions God's word. He questions what God had spoken to and over humans. And then he starts to twist God's words a little bit. You know, God had said they could eat from any tree except that one over there. But Satan, he puts words in God's mouth. He says, did God really say you must not eat from any tree? Right? Any tree? Eve, Eve tries to correct him at this point. Well, well, actually, God said this, but, but yes, he did say if we eat from that tree, we will die. But see, Satan, he's, he's sly. He, he's crafty. You know, in fact, the first word that describes him in Scripture is crafty. And so he weaves in another lie, another mistruth. He says, no, 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 you won't. You won't die. In fact, if you do that, if you take hold of the fruit, you will be like God. What's Satan doing here? Well, for starters, he's, he's denying what God had already said about who they were about who Adam and Eve were. You see, they were already made in God's image. They were already like God. But Satan said, no, 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 no. Look, if you do this, if you eat that fruit, you'll be even more like God. You see, I think that's one of the greatest theft tactics that he uses. He denies what God has already spoken about who we are. He denies it. He tries to to add to it or change it. You know, a a lot of times uh, he'll even use other people in our life to to speak that into us. He'll use other people in our lives that we're close to, that we love, to do this. Maybe you've heard things throughout your life like, well, you're just no good. You're not worth it. You'll never amount to anything. Who could ever love someone like you? You're helpless, you're hopeless, you're dumb, you're a a loser, uh, you're not good enough. And unfortunately, after we've heard these things over and over again, we begin to believe these things that have been said about us. We believe them in the core of who we are to the point where we allow it to rob us of our true identity. We quit listening to what God has said about who we are, and we choose to listen to the lies. We accept a false identity. And I think that's when Satan takes it a step further. Look at what he does here in Genesis chapter 3. He actually encourages the woman to find her identity in something other than God. Right? And so he he says, like, uh, he says, I want you to look at this fruit right here. This fruit. This fruit is what will give you your identity. This is what will give you your being. Come on, don't you want to, don't you want to be like God, all-knowing, able to discern all truth and knowledge? You'll, you'll open your eyes to a world of possibilities. Uh, look at that man over there. If you eat this fruit, you'll be smarter than he ever was. Uh, you, you'll, you'll never lose an argument with your husband again. You know, I think... Uh, As I imagine it, I see Eve sitting there mulling it over, and maybe she glances over and notices Adam and thinks, wow, he he really does kind of look like a Neanderthal, and, uh, you know, he he, he looks like that, but I, I can see that he's still stronger than me. You know, if I do this, at least I'll have the edge on intelligence, right? At least I'll be smarter than him which is another mistake, ladies, because uh, from the very beginning, you already had the brains of the outfit, okay? You didn't need the fruit for that. But we see in verse 6, 
It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So she eats the fruit. She's hoping that by doing that, she'll find a new and improved identity. Now, Adam, who probably was sitting there like a Neanderthal, who's right there with her, watching all this happen, he looks over and he sees a pretty girl offering him some food. And he probably thought in that moment, well, wow, if I just do what she says, then she'll like me more. She'll, she'll think I'm a champ. She'll think I'm a stud. You know, Scripture calls Satan the father of lies, uh, which is why I think he's the father of all advertising as well. Because ever since the garden, ever since this moment, anyone in advertising in all of human history has known that all you got to do is get a pretty girl holding some food and you can get a man to do anything, right? You see, both the man and the woman thought they could find a new identity by disobeying God and taking the fruit, taking matters, taking their life in their own hands. Satan made them believe that by doing this, they would find who they really are. But remember, identities can't be found. They're only given. And in this case, they were taken away. Verse 7 it says, then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. What's the first thing they do when they realize that their identity was gone? Well, they hid in shame. You see, before they ate the fruit, they were fully living out their true identity. They could be exactly who they were, who they were meant to be. They could be as they were. They could come before God uh, as children before their father, completely unashamed, confident in who they were. They didn't need masks. They didn't need any kind of coverings, nothing to hide. But after they sinned, they were immediately ashamed They hid themselves, afraid of God to see them as they were. Now, why do you think that was? Why is that? It's because who they were was gone. It had been stolen from them. It had been taken from them. In fact, according to God's own words, they were dead. Remember what God had said? Chapter 2, he said, When you eat from the fruit from that tree, you will certainly die. In fact, some translations include the phrase, that day, or in that day, you will certainly die. Now, wait a second here. When I look at this, I... I don't think Adam and Eve died, did they? I mean, they weren't dead. They still uh, were walking and talking around. I mean, they didn't keel over and shrivel up as soon as they ate the fruit. They, they were still cognitively aware of the situation. They still had the ability to go run and hide and cover themselves. They still uh, felt emotion, right? They had shame. What, what's going on here? Was God just bluffing them when he said, you will die? Was he being like that dad who, uh, you know, discovering that he can't control his kids, that he threatens them by saying if they disobey him one more time, he's going to take away Christmas and Halloween and all other holidays, right? The dad who says, look, if you do that one more time, you'll be grounded for the rest of your life. What's, What's going on here? Well, yes, yes, Adam and Eve, their bodies were still alive, but who they were at the core, who they were on the inside, the spirit that God created and put inside of them, their true identity rooted in their very being, well, that was dead. You see, just because something dies doesn't mean it ceases to exist. Think about maybe a pet you had growing up as a child. Maybe maybe it was a dog that died and and you, you buried it in the backyard or Uh, Maybe a a goldfish that you ended up having to flush down the drain. Just because they died and you no longer saw them 
doesn't mean they cease to exist. Their, their body was still there. Adam and Eve, they weren't, they weren't zapped into oblivion the moment they sinned. You see, physically they still remained, but, but who they were, their identity, their spirit, it died within them that day. And you know, friends, the same is true for us. The moment sin enters uh, our lives, something dies within us. When we choose to find our identity outside of God, outside of the, the identity that He gave us, our spirit, our true self, it's gone. The New Testament says we were dead because of sin. So God wasn't bluffing. He wasn't fibbing. When we sin, who we are at the core, it dies, even though our body is still here. Once sin enters our life, it destroys everything we have. Every good thing, every relationship, it falls apart. Sin wreaks havoc. It brings chaos and confusion. And so no wonder so many people are out there trying to find their identity in so many other things. It's because sin has separated them. Sin has killed the one true identity given to us by God. And so the question is, well, what are we supposed to do? What on earth do we do? Well, thankfully, we have an example. There was someone who showed us how to live in our true identity. Someone who provided the perfect picture of what it means to be made in the image of God and to live in the image of God. Someone who did not allow his identity to be stolen by the thief. And friends, that, of course, is Jesus. You see, so shortly after Jesus was baptized, he went out to the wilderness, and he spent 40 days fasting and praying. And it's in this account of, of Jesus' life, this part of his life, this is where we see that ancient, crafty serpent show up once again. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 4 and follow along. And starting in verse 1, it says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. I want you to notice that Satan begins in on Jesus the, uh, the same way he had with those very first people in the garden. He questions the identity that was given to Jesus by God. He says, if you are, if you are the Son of God. I mean, isn't, isn't that the mind game that Satan plays with us too? How, how many times have you heard that whisper in your ear? If you, if you really belong to God, you wouldn't struggle with that. If you, if you really loved God and He loved you, you wouldn't have those kinds of thoughts. If you were really God's, you wouldn't act that way. You wouldn't blow it all the time. You wouldn't mess things up. If you are, if you are, if. You see, when, when we are weak and hurting like Jesus was in this moment, He had gone 40 days without eating. He was weak. He was hurting. In this moment, Satan loves to question what God has said about us. But I want you to look at what Jesus does in verse 4. It says, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, in, in that moment when, when Satan is questioning his identity and saying, if, if you are, if you are, Jesus doesn't go, you know, wow, I have been looking at this all wrong. I mean, by golly, I am the Son of God. And you know what? Now it's time for me to prove it. I'm going to define myself by my ability, by my power to do what I want to do. I'm going to define myself by my power to change these rocks into bread. That's not what Jesus does. Instead, Jesus stands firm in the identity that had been spoken over him by God. Jesus says, look, uh, my life, who I am, 
It doesn't come from anything except what? He says, except every word from the mouth of God. Who I am is determined. Who I am is defined by what God has said about me, not what anyone else or anything else has. And so I don't need to look any further because I cannot find what has already been given to me. Twice more in this account, it, Satan comes back and he questions Jesus. He says, if you are, if you are the Son of God. And each time Jesus answers, it is written, God has said, God has spoken. You see, Jesus declares to the thief that being a true child of God, true sonship comes from obeying the Father's will. Something that humans failed at from the very beginning. We, we failed at that in the garden. We failed at that all of our lives, obeying the Father's will. But Jesus didn't. You know, later in his ministry, Jesus would say this about the thief. John, one of Jesus' disciples, wrote this in chapter 10 of his gospel account. He said, Jesus said this, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Wow, isn't that so true of the story we heard uh, today? Think back to that Genesis account. First, Satan stole man's identity. He robbed him of who he was, which in turn killed the spirit inside of him. It killed his spirit, the very nature of who he was. And because sin had entered his life, well, it destroyed everything. Steal, kill, and destroy. That is Satan's goal. The total destruction of your life, of who you are. Jesus says that is his only objective. To take away who you are at your core to replace life with death. He wants to take away the identity that God has given you. And he wants you to try to find it in anything and everything else. He wants you to define who you are by your job, by sports, by your retirement account, or your looks, or your talents, or your past, or your status, or the number of friends and followers you have on social media, the number of likes and shares. He wants you to define it by the car you drive or the people you've dated, anything except God and what He has said about you. And friends, when you do that, when you try to define who you are, yourself, rather than looking to the one who made you and gave you your purpose, when you try to answer the question, who am I apart from him? Eventually, the only thing you're going to find is loneliness and depression and destruction and death. But not so with Jesus. Jesus says this. He says, you know, the thief comes to do all that, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came so that we can reclaim that identity that was given to us in the very beginning. I love these words from author David Lomas. He says this, he says, Deep inside our DNA is the memory of a garden. It was the only place where we humans have ever understood our identity fully, a place where what we were made to do and what we actually did were one and the same. Whether you choose to believe it or not, whether you choose to accept it, ingrained in your very nature is a longing to return to that place where you fully realize and fully embrace the identity given to you by your Creator. That you are God's creation. You are His child made in His image. And it's in Christ that we find this place. The place where who we truly are and what we were created to do, where they intersect. In Christ, our identity that we rejected when we sinned against God is now resurrected to new life. In Him, we find the confidence to stand up to all those lies of the thief. We find that, that boldness to say, look, you might say this about me. You might say this about who I am, 
but this is what God has said about who I am. In Christ, we have the power to live our life in the image of God, just like Jesus did. And so today, if you are tired of searching and searching, trying to to find who you are, looking to thing after thing in your life for meaning and purpose, then look no further. Because at the end of the day, your identity can't be found because it was already given to you a long time ago. And so today I invite you to just simply receive it. You are a child of God made in the image of God. Nothing is more true about you and who you are when you belong to Christ. And so I want to invite you to choose to receive Him. And as you do that, you will receive your true identity. You will receive who you are. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know now that there is an enemy out there. He is real. He is deceitful. He's sneaky. He seeks to devour us. He will stop at nothing to get us to define who we are by anything else than you. God, forgive us at those times when we have looked to ourselves and to other people, to other things, to give our life meaning and purpose. Forgive us when we have allowed the lies of the enemy to inform and shape our identity. Because, Lord, we know that it's you. It's only you that gives us our true identity. You spoke it over us at creation. You told us who we were as you knit us together in our mother's womb. And you have said that we are yours. We belong to you. We are made in your image and that you love us above all creation. Thank you for sending your son Jesus as the perfect example of what it looks like to live out our true identity. And thank you for the cross that gives us grace for all those times that we have failed to live it out, Father. We're thankful for your son. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Well, thank you again for tuning in today. Uh, Again, as always, we invite you, if you have questions or you'd like to talk to one of our pastors or one of our leaders here, uh, please give us a call. Reach out to us online and on social media. We want to meet with you. We want to sit down and have a conversation with you. Uh, So please do that. Uh, We're going to continue our series next week. So we invite you back. Same time, uh, same channel. We'll see you then.